Good morning, everyone. Uh, we're just going to let folks file in here for a second. Welcome. Let's see. Folks are coming in. All right. Well, um, I'll just start quickly as, as folks continue to file in uh, by orienting you briefly to the Zoom functionality on this webinar. I'm sure you're all very familiar with Zoom at this point, um, but we'll just go over some tools briefly. And after that, I'll go into some brief introductions and, and the flow of the webinar today. So my colleague Megan Fowler and I are your tech supports today. Uh, please feel free to send us a private chat message if you're having any technical issues or if you need any further direct support throughout the call. Uh, we're keeping everybody on mute today just to keep things a little bit less chaotic. Um, for the, the start video button, um, if you're comfortable, we encourage everyone to turn on their video for networking purposes, but um, no need to do that if, if you're not. The participants button there allows you to view lists of the other folks who are here on the call with us today. And the chat button, I'm sure you're all familiar with this as well, but this one's really important. Um, the moderators will be sharing links and information with the group in the chat. So to view it, just click it and a sidebar will pop up and you can use the chat box to pose any questions or comments you have throughout the presentation. And we're going to do our best to get to everyone's questions during the Q&A section, sections of the agenda. Um, notice too, there's a, a drop down that will allow you to chat to either everyone uh, who's here on the call or privately to an individual. The presentation today is being recorded and we'll make it available on AFT's website, along with a resource handout um, with resources that will be mentioned by today's speakers. Today we're also going to be running a few polls to gauge where you as the audience is at to keep you all on your toes. And so uh, please just take a minute to fill out this first poll here. We just want to get a sense of, of who's here in the room with us. And as you're filling that out, I just wanted to start by extending a formal welcome to you to the third webinar of the Farms for the Future project, Solar Siting and Farmland. My name is Jamie Pottern. I'm the New England Program Manager at American Farmland Trust. And my colleague Emily Cole and I will be your MCs for the next 90 minutes on this webinar. So, poll results here. Let's see what we got. Interesting. 18% uh, of you are municipal volunteer staff. We've got about 36% land trusts and volunteers. Uh, that's really great. So a bunch of nonprofit service providers and some state agency staff. Uh, so interesting mix of folks and this is great. Yeah, this is really our, our intended audience uh, for, for this webinar. So we're we're really glad that you are all here with us today. Thanks so much. So just a little bit of backstory about the workshop series. This series was created through the partnership and truly incredible organizing efforts of the following people and organizations. My colleague Megan Fowler and myself at AFT, Stephanie Morningstar at the Northeast Farmers of Color Land Trust. She's here on the call with us today with Steph. I'm Meg Quinn at Maine Farm Land Trust, who's here on the call as well. Emmy Luigi at Southeast Land Trust of New Hampshire, and Nancy Everhart of the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board. And this project has been generously funded by Jane's Trust. So we're joined today by some wonderful guest speakers who are working at the intersection of solar, climate change, and farmland protection in our region. We're so excited to have them on today. Um, Emily Cole, who I mentioned, AFT's New England Climate and Agriculture Program Manager, Jake Marley, who's the Managing Director at Hyperion Systems, LLC. Ellen Stern Griswold, who's the Policy and Research Director at Maine Farmland Trust. And Nancy McBrady, um, who's the Bureau Director at Maine CACF. Um, so we're so, so excited to have this powerhouse group of folks with us today. And just a little bit more about the series here. Uh, as I mentioned, this webinar is the, the third in a five part series of educational workshops that we have designed specifically for land trust municipalities and other nonprofits and service providers um, who are based in Maine, as well as the other Northern New England states. Um, those who want to better understand how to support farms and farmers in their communities. Um, and especially due to COVID-19, as I'm sure you're all aware, there just appears to be this real growing interest in local agriculture, a growing desire for more skills and training for securing a more resilient food system. Um, at the local level, as well as advancing greater land justice. So therefore, each workshop has been designed to offer some core content, some state-specific tools and resources, Q&A, and networking opportunities. 
And each workshop also builds off of the previous one. And so um, if you didn't catch the ones before this, we really encourage you to try to go back um, and, and catch the recordings that are up on our website and to definitely join us for the upcoming workshops. Um, just briefly about the series, the first workshop um, offered a broad overview of principles and tools for developing more farm-friendly communities. Last week's workshop dug into some specific strategies and tools for farm protection. This one today is discussing solar siting options and considerations on farmland. And next week, uh, you'll have the opportunity to tune in to learn about strategies and tools for making farmland available to farmers, followed by our final workshop, tools and resources for supporting Black, Indigenous, and farmers of color in your community. So we'll go over the dates of these and other related upcoming workshops at the end of this presentation. Um, so before I hand it off to Emily, I'm just going to quickly run through the agenda. Um, you're going to first hear from Emily. She's going to share her extensive knowledge on the landscape of solar siting on farmland in New England, um, AFT's position and work in this space, and some best practices and approaches. Nancy McBrady will provide an overview of concerns, opportunities, and solar resources for Maine. And then Ellen Stern Griswold will talk about solar compatibility and options on conserved land. We'll then have a Q&A with the two of them, followed by a presentation um, and Q&A session with Jake Marley about the economics of small-scale solar on farmland. And then we'll wrap up with um, some sharing some upcoming workshops, and we're going to do our very best to end by 11.30 sharp. So I'll stop talking, and without further ado, I'll hand it off to my colleague, Emily. Take it away, Em. Thank you, Jamie. Uh, thanks, everybody, for being here today. Um, as my colleague Jamie just mentioned, I'm Emily Cole. I'm the Climate and Agriculture Program Manager for New England here at AFT. Um, and I'd say about my brain is split 50-50 between dealing with so soil health on farmland, which is so important, and solar siting on farmland, which is so important. Um, and so I'd like to spend a little bit of time at the start of this to talk about why AFT is in this conversation, how we got here, and a little bit of background um, of our organizational <laughs> movement from realizing that this is something we need to deal with to diving in head first with so many of our regional partners. So uh, as you can see, you know, there are many different ways that we have to handle solar siting and we would prefer that there was zero solar on farmland um, in terms of farmland loss. And we would prefer that we had lots of solar on all of those preferred sites like rooftops and uh, carport, uh, you know, siting maybe on contaminated lands, um, that would be great. <laughs> you know, if we had the, the status quo, if you look at the top uh, left-hand corner of this spectrumed arrow, um, you know, if we sort of just continued in our path uh, as things were before solar became a, a land use conflict and we had zero solar, all ag land, you know, that's sort of where we would be. Um, we could focus more on the other aspects of it. Notice there's a little asterisk there though. I'll come right back to that. Then down on the other end of the solar siting spectrum, we would see sort of open doors to farmland solar siting. Um, and while there are very compatible uh, solar siting methods and designs with farmland and, and very compatible, um, I would say siting guidelines, if we just opened the door, we would see significant loss to large scale development that is not compatible with preserving or continuing farming on that land. Um, if we go back to the status quo asterisk for a second, if we kept solar off of farmland, we would still lose farmland. Um, so even though status quo would maybe remove solar from the picture, we would lose it to residential development, we would lose it um, you know, during transitions, uh, during farmers' retirement, trying to find uh, someone to take over. You know, that's a really difficult time to, to keep farmland in farming. We would also lose it to climate change. And so that's where we start, start going back down the spectrum towards solar siting as an alternative to losing farmland for those reasons. Perhaps there's a way where we can integrate solar on lands that are less productive. We can integrate types of solar that can continue farming in and around them called dual use. Um, simultaneously, we can move the needle on climate change mitigation with clean energy and 
continue farming our most productive farmlands. And so we're using the sort of all encapsulating term of smart solar siting to think about all of those processes. Go ahead, Megan. So I like this uh, the sort of burnt orange colored phrasing um, underneath the image of the, the cow with the solar panels in the background. That's UMass um, Ag Research Farm, and that's one of their, their solar arrays. Uh, maximizing potential renewable energy while minimizing impact on the nation's most productive farmland and other resources. And that is really why AFT is in this conversation. In 2017, AFT held its first workshop on solar siting and farmland to really gauge what our regional partners were seeing, what were the issues, what were our concerns, and, and get a, you know, take our temperature on the values that we all hold around farmland preservation and how do we support that and our values around climate change mitigation. Uh, after that workshop, um, we started to really think about how as an organization we can move solar forward, we can protect farmland all within our mission of protecting the land, you know, supporting the farmers and promoting good practices. And so we've come up with some thoughts, <laughs> some organizational um, pathways that we think can, can help drive this conversation um, in a more positive direction for both. And so our key point here is that to combat climate change, we're going to need solar energy, but it does not have to sacrifice agricultural land. Um, in fact, that we don't want it to <laughs> sacrifice any agricultural land whatsoever, but we know that there has to be some sort of middle ground to move the needle forward for both. Uh, our regional states have you know, really dramatic um, reduction goals in greenhouse gas emissions, and, and that's great. Um, we have to get there somehow. And uh, we see a lot of, when we have coastal areas like Maine and Massachusetts and Connecticut, we have a lot of conversations around offshore wind. We see some conversations around wind uh, inland as well, but a lot of our land loss conversation is around solar. And so we know that farmland uh, is threatened by solar and our solution, again, is this, this middle road of smart solar siting. Go ahead, Jane. Next one, thank you. And so one way that we are trying to approach this is really diving in, learning about, and sharing the, the perspective use of dual-use solar. And here are a few images. Um, some of them uh, really showcase the height and space that could be available in some alternate designs of solar siting. Uh, some show the really interesting use. Uh, basically, you could have a partly shaded, you know, farmyard with solar. I really like the chickens in that one. That one is a, a Japanese solar sharing farm. Um, and then others, you can really integrate more regional crops. So in the one at the bottom, it's the UMass dual use uh, array again. And you'll hear from Jake Marley, and it was his uh, company that actually installed that array and has partnered with UMass. Um, and they're actually growing vegetables underneath. They've done grazing studies, now they're working on vegetable studies and there's some really promising results. Okay. Next one, thank you. Um, and so in all of this, we are a, a land trust. We are, we are here to preserve the land and support the farmers and the, and the practices. So when we are going to get into the conversation around solar siting, we're gonna make sure that there are really clear guidelines that align with the values that AFT holds dear. And that is prioritizing the land, you know, protecting the farmers and their ability to continue farming, and then really making sure that the, the agriculture that we need <laughs> for future uh, can be prioritized. So um, these are sort of the three facets, and the first being prioritizing, no, you're fine, <laughs> prioritizing the land. So if we're gonna think about solar on farmland, the, the best case scenario first is to really guide that solar to fields or lands uh, that are less productive, um, perhaps already disturbed, maybe marginal. The term marginal farmland has lots of vague definitions. Um, using it somewhat openly here, but really depending on the farmer to have that information, which they will, they know the areas that are not very productive, perhaps you've got some clay issues, some drainage issues, rocky, uh, highly um, sloped fields that are difficult um, to, to farm actively. Perhaps it's more marginal pasture, places where 
the actual production that's happening on farm would be very limited in its disruption. Um, the other option are places like the wasteland where you have your all of your old you know tractor equipments, <laughs> the old combine, uh, the old uh, you know disc pieces, all of those things that are sort of collecting space, that would be a great place to try to utilize for some solar siting. You're not using it for agriculture at the moment. And so if we can guide it to those types of lands, those types of fields and spaces, then that means that we can protect prime farmland better. We can protect active, unique, or, or statewide important farmland better. Um, it doesn't mean that we won't uh, encourage proper siting if, if solar is going to go on those types of soils. Um, in fact, if we're going to see solar move on to prime farmland or actively farmed unique um, farmland, it would be really uh, important to AFT that that solar be dual use solar. Uh, raised, spaced out, you're, you're able to farm in and around the panels for multiple different uses and there's flexibility in that design to change the actual agricultural production that's under and around the panels in the future. Um, the, the other aspect of this is when we're thinking about land is really protecting farmland as a whole and trying to move as best we can solar onto those priority and preferred sites first. And this is really more about policy and encouraging and incentivizing that type of siting. Um, trying to keep it in um, already disrupted spaces, already you know, developed spaces that um, not only will we not see the agricultural or environmental impacts, but we may actually gain benefits from having some sort of shade canopy, like in, in solar carports and such. Um, but it really does come down to incentivizing the preferred siting. And then if we're going to move it to farmland, which it, all of the studies are pointing that we will need to have solar on our green spaces. So we know farmland is a target when that happens. We need to incentivize the right kind of solar on farmland when we do that. And then the, the third leg of AFT's, well, one of the legs of AFT's mission is really working with farmers and, and helping farmers continue their work and, and stay on their land. Um, farmers are the best stewards and farmers know their land the best and farmers know what they need to continue farming. And so if we're gonna have solar on farmland, they absolutely have to be a part of the conversation. Um, you know, if this is going to be a dual use array and they're going to continue farming, they're going to know the equipment they need, they're going to know the space, they know the turns, they have that information. If they're not at the table, the design can really go awry and then make it difficult for them to really adequately be able to access that land and farm it. Uh, the other aspect of this is that, you know, when we're thinking about dual use on farmland, if there is an incentive for that, we want to make sure that there is continued agriculture on that land. And so you want to have a design that's flexible enough to allow changes in farm planning, allow changes in ownership or management of that farmland so that it can go from uh, squash production, maybe to hay, maybe to grazing. Um, and so the flexibility of the design on farmland is really important as well. Uh, the conversation that AFT is having internally, <laughs> that I started having internally in 2017 and then started having with our, our regional partners in New England and around all of our internal priorities um, has shaped a partnership that we've been working on for the past two years called the New England Smart Solar Siting Partnership. And this is an effort that um, we have been leading with Acadia Center and Vote Solar, who are clean energy advocates, Conservation Law Foundation, and Vermont Law School. And we've really been spending two years, um, and some of you here on the call today may have been interviewed by us around your own uh, priorities and values around land protection and clean energy. We've been spending two years really gathering as much information and, and using the input as, as, uh, from as many stakeholders as we can to guide uh, a set of practices and principles um, and potential policies that we've put forward and put together that we hope will really reduce conflict in terms of solar siting in communities on green spaces um, across New England. Because we know our, our land here is of, um, it's of high value. <laughs> 
we, we have a lot of uh, people and not a lot of land. We need a lot of food and not a lot of space to farm it. We use a lot of energy and we don't have a lot of, uh, we don't have enough clean energy production to support that. Go ahead, Megan. And so this project, which has been going on for just under two years, is really culminating this fall. Um, and we're really excited to, to put forward and share what we've been doing and what we've developed to try to encourage this balanced approach, this middle ground of smart solar siting where we can keep farming, keep our farmlands and produce that clean energy that we are so desperately need to, to combat climate change. And so we have a set of seven or eight analyses that we've put forward. Um, they'll be released really in the next couple of weeks and then we're going to have a workshop series. It's a four part series um, that will start Wednesday, September 23rd. And I'll put the, after I'm done speaking, I'll put the, the registration link in the chat box for anyone that's interested. But we've developed some guiding principles for how you really go about building a solar program and fundamentally includes keeping stakeholders, bringing stakeholders in and then keeping stakeholders in, being really transparent with information and trying to use data-driven analyses to achieve both solar siting, farmland protection, and the goal of climate mitigation. We've uh, broken down land use uh, scenarios for each state, looking at farmland and forest land and contaminated sites and rooftops, and tried to put down some potential reasonable targets that can help us get to where we need to go in the next 10 years, not all the way to meet the full um, renewable portfolio standards of clean energy, but you know, thinking about sort of the, the next decade in front of us, how to make a, a, some headway in that. We've also uh, done a comparison of policies from state to state. I think learning from our neighbors can sometimes be the, the most valuable, whether you're learning from positive um, experiences or learning from things that didn't go so well in your neighboring states that you can improve upon. Uh, we've looking at more specifically how we could site forest and farmland, um, solar on forest and farmland, what areas of those types of land uses can we site it on with least impact um, to gain some of our goals. And then we've also looked at specifically, uh, and actually in, in a lot of detail, the contaminated sites, because we know that's a common uh, sort of response to we need more solar, well, let's put it on old landfills or let's put it on old you know, contaminated sites that are, that are closed down. It's old Superfund sites. Well, only so many of them are actually viable for solar. And so we, we tried to do a, a statistical evaluation and then an individual evaluation of the big ones to see what was really possible. Um, and then lastly, we've done a cost analysis um, to, to give municipal and state agencies an idea of what some of these alternatives would mean if you're gonna try to push those moving forward um, and then have, have really uh, dived into dual use to try to showcase what that could be if we can put more effort and energy into to research and piloting that across the region. So, um, I'm gonna pause for a second here and just recap with that. You know, AFT is in this conversation and we're here because if there is not conservation at the table when we're talking about solar siting, then conservation values will um, get pushed down to the, to the bottom of the barrel. And so it's important for us to be here and we hope and encourage all of the other conservation organizations, all of the other land trusts that you um, get active and be a part of the conversation so that your values uh, can be heard and can be at the table. Because without those really from the get-go, it's gonna be really difficult um, to make changes in hindsight. So if we can be, uh, you know, really loud and upfront with it, hey, you're forgetting about us being able to produce our own food <laughs> and our agricultural economy, we need to make sure that, that those aren't left behind. So I'm gonna pause there um, and we're going to take a, a moment. I'm going to move to the next one. And uh, I want to ask you, what are some of the issues that you're seeing in your communities? And it could be um, things like the loss of prime farmland, lo uh, lack of adequate policies. Maybe you're hearing that farmers are being approached by solar developers. Maybe you're hearing from farmers that they're looking for resources around their solar options. Um, maybe you're seeing communities that are proactively planning, which would be great. Um, 
you know, and maybe there's, there's not enough policy really around farm friendly solar. Or maybe you're seeing something different. If you're seeing something different, I would love for you to put it in the chat so that we can get an idea of what we've missed. But take a, a moment or two, uh, tell us what you're seeing, and then we'll share out our results in just a moment. Okay, wow. So uh, resounding lack of adequate policies that incentivize smart solar. Well, uh, I agree. <laughs> and hopefully uh, what we've been working on and what we're all gonna share in our webinar in a few weeks will help that, um, at least understanding what these policies could look like. Um, but we're also seeing on here, farmer seeking resources, uh, lack of policies to support farm friendly solar, and 45% communities proactively planning for solar. And I think that is so important and cannot encourage um, really states enough and municipal associations enough to, to think about this ahead of time, because once it's knocking on your door, you're already behind the curve. So let's think about where would you want solar? How could you encourage the right kind of solar? And then maybe you could even have competitive bidding for the right types of solar and, and get costs down for your, um, for your residents. So that's great. Thank you. Anything else in our, uh, let's see. I don't see anything else in our, our chats, but if you do have other things that you're seeing, please share and we'll, um, we're happy to hear them. And so that's enough of me talking. <laughs> and take a breath and I'm going to introduce our next speaker. Um, we're very lucky to have Nancy McBrady, who's the director for the Bureau of Agriculture, Food and Rural Resources in DACF Maine. Um, thank you so much for being here. She's going to give you her perspective or the main DACF perspective on solar siting and farmland. So take it away, Nancy. Good morning, everybody. Thanks for having me here. Um, pleased to, to share some insights uh, about solar development from the perspective of the Maine Department of Agriculture, uh, Conservation and Forestry. And uh, much of what uh, Emily was mentioning in her presentation with respect to uh, the loss of agricultural lands um, and trying to find ideally a happy medium is something that is very much uh, the perspective uh, of the department and i um, happy to go through that um, going forward. Um, I think what I'm going to do first in my presentation is first um, share some data to illustrate how impactful solar development could be in Maine. Um, so I have my notes open here, so I'm going to be toggling back and forth, but um, as many of you may already know, in 2019, there was solar energy, uh, solar energy legislation passed in the Maine legislature, um, which really opened the doors uh, for applications for development um, with relation to commercial scale solar projects. And it really has been a rush since then um, to move in that direction. Um, after a long period where that had not um, been the possibility here in the state. One of the department's uh, groups, the Maine Natural Areas Program, has been really instrumental in reviewing um, solar projects in their purview. And I'll tell you a little bit more about them in a second. But first, to these numbers here, um, they saw, it's, it's quite staggering, um, a 15% 15 in, 15 fold increase in their review of solar projects in the first half of 2020 as compared to the first half of 2019 in just one year. And of those 188 solar projects that they reviewed just this year, many, the vast majority of them are over 20 acres. So what is MNAP's role? Um, they provide a really important tool um, and, and looking for exemplary and rare botanical features um, throughout the state, and in particular for projects. So um, they actually do a technical desktop review of sites proposed for development. And that is how these solar projects pass in front of them. Um, and in this slide here, this is the same statistics as in the, in the prior slide, I believe, and it's just showing locations geographically as to where um, solar and non-solar projects are. And um, just to let you know, non-solar can be subdivisions, 
telecommunication facilities, uh, literally non-solar projects that would be developed. But those obviously can also impact agricultural farms. We all know that development um, does put that pressure on agricultural fields. And then the unknown, those also could potentially include solar. Um, many of the people who request this environmental review um, don't divulge what they're doing um, necessarily. Um, so there, there could be more than what these numbers uh, represent at present. Do you want to go to the next slide? Um, what we do know is that solar developments are aggressively looking at farms and have the potential to profoundly impact uh, prime soils and soils of statewide significance. And over the first six months of 2020, 88% of the solar projects reviewed intersected with MAP farmland soils. And that's a total of up of maybe 8,500 acres of farmland soil. Now, not every single project is going to be permitted. We know that this is a lengthy and expensive process. And yet, um, if everything were to go through, um, that's, that's a heck of a lot of acreage uh, here in the state of Maine. And this photo is not of a, of a farm that's going to be converted. It's for illustrative uh, purposes only. But obviously, as we all know, farmland uh, is flat and it's wide. And it really is um, super uh, uh, productive when it comes to, and it's super attractive when it comes to solar development for obvious reasons. All right, next page. We'll ease into the numbers here further. Um, so this was just the beginning, the first three months of um, the year of, of the potential soil impact tracking that um, Maine Natural Areas Program did. You see that there were 114 solar uh, uh, developments that requested their review and the total acreage of farmland soils is, is high um, and prime farmland and statewide important farmland uh, soils are, are recounted in the columns below. Um, and an MNAT hit, just in case you're, you're curious, um, it's just the intersection of, of, a pros pro, of a proposed project, excuse me, with the features that MNAP is looking for, occurrences of rare, threatened, and endangered plants um, or other exemplary natural communities. Um, so going into the next slide, We've got the next three months of the year where again, um, there were an additional 88 known solar uh, applications that MNAP reviewed and the soil statistics that relate to those. So that's how we're getting to that 8,500 number of potential farmland soils. Um, so that's a lot. So that's a lot of development just in one year uh, that's been proposed that um, MNAP as an agency has been able to review uh, and, and look at. And they're doing a stellar job of keeping the department aware of what's happening and connecting the dots between the Department of Environmental Protection, the Department of Agriculture, Inland Fisheries and Wildlife, et cetera, so that we are all having eyes on what this proposed uh, development means. If we can go to the next slide. So I'm just putting up here a recent example. If any of you were watching the news maybe a week or so ago, um, there was a, a large um, uh, project that was proposed by DE Shaw Renewable Investments in Northern Lakes Energy. This is a, a snapshot of one of the three sites that is associated with the $100 million project. It is not of the one area that um, has been identified in Lewiston along the Androscoggin River that includes agricultural farmlands. I just threw this in so that you were aware of the, uh, the project itself. Um, it's a total capacity of 201 megawatts with enough energy to power 20,000 homes. Um, and again, uh, Lewiston um, has farmlands involved with it. What's interesting about this is that one of the se segments um, pro proposed would be um, located next to the re-energy biomass power plant. So there are interesting overlays with respect to renewable energy here, um, whether solar or biomass. Um, so moving along, just from a policy perspective, um, we obviously embrace the position that uh, replacing fossil fuels with alternative uh, renewable energy sources is an objective for the state. And that's been very clear from the policies put forward by the governor to date. Um, and we agree 
that solar development should not negatively impact our agricultural and natural resources of the state, active farmland, productive timberland, rare plant populations, and those exemplary, exemplary natural communities that um, MNAP is looking after and others. Next slide. Um, we do encourage that commercial scale solar projects be sited on non-agricultural areas first and foremost and avoid those impacts that we all know could occur. But we're also realistic. We do know that if solar is going to be developed on agricultural land, we would encourage the development of dual use solar projects. Um, if you wanna to go to the next slide. So before I go into this, I, I will speak to that dichotomy and that tension between development of farmlands and, um, and the dual use, whether or not that might be attractive to those involved. Um, as many of you likely know, farmers are uh, a, a very um, resilient group of people and uh, farming is not a lucrative profession. And so for many, <laughs> Um, so we also understand that there are uh, economic incentives for farmers to consider utilizing their land. Uh, it's their private property um, and uh, we can certainly understand why someone might entertain uh, solar siting on their farm uh, for the economic benefits that they might not be uh, receiving right now through agriculture. So this is why we certainly do believe that it's important for all of us to be working together to make sure that folks understand what they're getting into when they are considering or are approached by solar developers um, and that they can understand with clear eyes uh, what this might mean. Um, so it is, it is, there is that tension and that is why we believe that dual use um, is really something that needs to be further demonstrated and possibly incentivized uh, to make that a reality. Um, at present, there aren't a lot of tools in our toolbox when it comes to protection of agricultural soils. Um, there are not scoring criteria or uh, regulatory or statutory um, protections at present um, within uh, the Maine Department of Environmental Protection's um, toolkit as well. Many of you uh, are, are working with municipalities, you know development processes and, and reviews um, often for large projects re require a DEP site location of development act um, permit and their rules and regulations relative to that again don't don't have agricultural soils as part of that review process. Um, Main PUC uh, in their development of this recent um, procurement um, proposals for for energy credits um, did create basically financial incentives to develop a, a appropriately sized solar projects and through their procurement announcement, and this gets a little complicated, PUC is asking for the developers to describe the site attributes um, and that goes into their calculation and, and ultimate um, review of those proposals. And those uh, developers are being asked to describe um, the uh, the percent of agricultural soils that would be impacted and also to describe whether or not these are dual use. If developers are impacting agricultural soils and it's not a dual use program, it doesn't mean that they won't be approved to go through the, the development pro uh, process, but it is a scoring mechanism for PUC um, that uh, is well outside of my bailiwick of understanding, um, but it, it was sort of an initial pass through, if you will. But again, that is not um, a policy stance uh, that has been translated into actual protections um, legislatively or, or from a regulatory perspective. Um, so at the very end here, I, I do have a, a mention about MNAP again. When they are asked to review uh, solar projects um, for potential impacts, they are now responding with a letter that uh, is from me and, and the Department of Agriculture, uh, it, alerting them to what prime farmland soils are and so state soils of um, significance, and uh, also encouraging them uh, about dual use. So at the very least, we're doing outreach, 
relative to um, those important factors. Go to the next slide. Okay, and I, that was it. So did I put four? Oh, sorry. I think we're missing a, let me go back. I think that's all I had on here for, I can look back. There was a, there was a slide, there should have been a slide. Yeah, there should have been one more slide. I can share my screen um, where we're talking about uh, what the department is doing to sort of fill the void. Um, so hang on, what, is that okay if I could share my screen? Sure. That's probably an important point to, to share. So we'll get that in there. Sure. Sure. Okay. Yeah, sorry, I missed that. Um, I'm not able to yet. Host disabled participant screen sharing, so. I'm not able to, still getting the host disabled participant screen sharing. Okay. This is Megan, I can pull up yours real quick if you'll, if you wanna, if you have it and can start to talk to it, I'll pull up yours real quick. So I have a polar, uh, a PowerPoint on here. When you say pull it up quick, what do you mean by that, sorry. Sorry, I was on mute. Um, I will, I'll pull it up if you want to start to speak to it. Okay, so what, do we, what the department has done to, to try and actively um, enter this space is to put forward some solar siting guidance. In May of this year, we issued um, guidance, rather technical guidance that's um, titled Determining Prime Farmland Soils and Soils of Statewide Importance for Siting Solar Projects in Maine. What does that mean? Well, as I mentioned, um, the PUC attributes that they're looking for um, has requested that um, there is an affidavit from a soil scientist um, that speaks to whether or not 10% of the project is located on land containing soils that are either prime farmland or farmland of statewide importance. And this technical guidance really is aimed to provide those consultants and soil scientists to go through that uh, process of demonstrating um, that 10% or lack thereof. Um, then, uh, to, soon to be released, it's, it's literally in its final review stages, we will be issuing technical guidance for commercial solar installation and development on agricultural, forested, and natural lands. And I'm really excited about this because I think that this is going to be extremely useful for a lot of people. Um, the intent of this was to provide um, technical guidance uh, to both farmers and, and, and forest landowners, as well as um, solar developers. And, and for farmers and, and the landowners, it's going to contain practical information um, to first con to consider uh, when approached about solar development or if they are interested themselves in solar development. Um, and it's going to walk through pre-construction, construction, and post-construction decommissioning activities. Um, so it really is meant to be quite holistic. And also it's going to provide technical information for the developers um, when considering designing, installing, and removing solar projects. So it's going to get into the, the wicket, the sticky wicket of um, directional drilling and, uh, you know, wetland considerations and et cetera. So it's hopefully going to um, meet a lot of needs out there um, and be very practical and, and beneficial. Um, the Maine Natural Areas Program is going to continue to review uh, these proposals from their perspective and um, MNAP will con continue to gather these important statistics about potential development, which I think is really crucial for the state. And then of course we have staff um, on hand that are available. Um, to answer questions. And I think Yvette is here. Um, Yvette, you wanna raise your hand and, and say hi. Uh, she, Yvette um, works within the Bureau uh, and has uh, actual uh, solar experience and has worked within her own town. And why don't you say just two words about yourself, Yvette? Just two, I'm Yvette. <laughs> Um, yeah, I work for the Department of Agriculture, the Bureau of Agriculture, and um, I do, I have worked for a solar company um, prior to this position. 
Um, I am also very active in the town of Topsom. We just um, passed our own solar zoning, zoning ordinance. Um, unfortunately, that was done after our town had got a purchase power agreement signed. So we're actually in someone else's backyard um, that doesn't have the protections that um, we put forward in, in our town. Um, so I'm very interested uh, in this on a personal level, but certainly on a professional level here at the department and happy to talk to anybody about what they're seeing and um, help with some of the guidance that we're creating. Great, thanks Yvette. Um, and that was it, all that I had. Uh, my contact information was in the next slide and I'm happy to answer questions as we move forward. Thank you so much, Nancy and Yvette. Um, so the, the guidance that you're gonna put forward in September, that you'll be able to find that right on the main DACF site? Absolutely, yep. Right. And we, we're happy to also um, send it out to our service provider colleagues as well. Awesome. Thanks so much. Uh, we'll have time for Q&A um, after our next presenter, Ellen Griswold from Maine Farmland Trust, um, who has um, been very involved with the solar siting, as I know that I've worked with her quite a few times on some of these issues. So we look forward to hearing what she has to say, and then we'll open up Q&A um, after her presentation to both Nancy and Ellen. So any more questions you have, go ahead and put them in the chat. Okay. Megan, are we able to get back to her presentation. Great, great. So great. take it away, Ellen. Great, thanks so much, Emily. And um, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Ellen Stern Griswold. I'm the Policy and Research Director at Maine Farmland Trust. Um, next slide, please. Um, so for anyone who's not familiar with Maine Farmland Trust, we're a member-powered statewide organization that works to protect farmland, support farmers, and advance the future of farming. Um, we just celebrated our 20th anniversary, and since 1999, um, we've helped to permanently protect nearly 300 farms and keep over 60,000 acres of farmland in farming um, while providing um, about 800 farm families with a wide range um, of services. Our main program areas are farmland protection, um, farmland access, helping farmers get on the land, um, farm viability, providing um, business planning and technical assistance to help farmers become and remain economically viable, and then policy and outreach work to really um, support the future of farming. Uh, next slide, please. So as Nancy mentioned, um, legislation last year really um, increased um, the amount of um, solar powered electrical generation um, development within the state. Um, and really for over a year now, we've been hearing from a lot of farmers um, who have been contacted by um, solar developers really from all over the country that have been coming to the state to try and find um, sites for their solar projects including on agricultural land that's near transmission infrastructure. Um, next slide, please. So I wanted just to provide a little bit of background on our work with this issue, because as Emily mentioned, um, we've been heavily involved for the last year or so. Um, and I always like to start these presentations just by echoing um, something that Emily really laid out as important to American Farmland Trust as well, which is that you know, we at MFT do believe that um, solar energy generation and agricultural production can coexist in Maine in a mutually beneficial manner. We understand that solar projects um, can be important, um, not only for addressing climate change and creating jobs throughout the state, um, but also as a really important source of economic support to farms. And as Nancy mentioned, um, farming can be a really, um, difficult uh, profession um, and not always as lucrative as it should be. Um, but we also wanna make sure that we're achieving the right balance in our planning processes and in our policies so that we make sure that while we support solar generation within the state, we're not losing um, important agricultural land as you know, Nancy was talking about before um, and we're not um, displacing agricultural production because um, I think the pandemic has really driven home the point that um, we need ag 
production in the state um, to be increasing, not decreasing, um, so that we make sure that we really are a, a food secure um, state and region and that um, we have a thriving agricultural section of our economy. Um, and we also don't want um, solar production to really impede land access. Um, one thing that we have been hearing from a bunch of farmers is a lot of concern about losing access to the land that they might be leasing because they simply can't compete um, with the lease rates um, that many solar developers are able to pay. So sort of that, that has been our focus is really trying to achieve that balance. Um, next slide, please. Um, <clears throat> and so in order to do so, um, Maine Farmland Trust for over a year now has been participating in a solar siting working group um, composed of ag service providers, environmental organizations, and solar energy developers um, to create um, some work products that we hope will really be helpful in achieving that balance. Um, one has been developing um, a list of best practices um, for solar siting on agricultural land. We've been commenting on proposed regulations um, and we have been providing some guidance materials to municipalities and um, that portion of our work is actually increasing, which I'll um, talk about in a minute. Um, next slide, please. And this is gonna mirror a little bit of what um, both Nancy and Emily were talking about in terms of best practices. But um, when we created as part of this working group, um, our list of best practices, um, we did so because we hoped that it would be an important sort or a helpful resource really for state officials, for municipal officials, and really for developers themselves. Um, and those, the th there, there are um, more than the three contained in that list, um, but these are the three that I really wanted to highlight um, because we really think it's important that when we're citing solar projects, we're avoiding um, prime farmland and farmland of statewide importance. Those are designations that are made by the um, Natural, Conservation, um, Natural Resources Conservation Service of USDA. Um, because those are the, that's the land that is um, most beneficial for agriculture and it's in limited supply. So we really wanna make sure that that land um, is kept for agriculture. Um, we also wanna make sure that um, when possible, we're using previously developed, disturbed, degraded um, land on a farmstead or we're using the sort of marginally productive portions um, of the farm property so that again, we're, we're having um, solar production and ag production coexist um, and not having one displace the other. And then as um, Emily was talking and, and Nancy mentioned as well, we are very much um, in favor of dual use projects um, where agriculture and um, solar electricity can be produced together. Um, and one of the things we've been really exploring is how we sort of create incentives um, so that those types of projects um, are more um, possible within the state. Next slide, please. Um, I, as I mentioned before, um, municipal guidance has been part of our work. And um, in 2011, MFT partnered with American Farmland Trust and the Maine Watch Institute, which no longer exists, to create a guide for municipalities on farm-friendly municipal policy tools and planning strategies. Um, we are currently updating the guide and um, that update will be available next year. Um, but I did, this slide sort of um, discusses the different components of the guide um, that we will be updating. Um, but I did want people to know that the new version of the guide will um, contain a section that um, talks about how different municipalities are regulating or permitting um, solar projects on ag land within their communities. Um, and if folks have examples of this, I know some folks on the call we've already been in touch with as part of the update process, but if you have information um, that would be um, relevant, um, please feel free to reach out because um, we would love to include that information in our, in our update. Um, next slide, please. Um, I also just wanted to let folks know that we at MFT also believe it's really important for farmers to have access to information 
um, and resources that they need to make informed decisions about their land. Um, one of the reasons we got involved in, in this issue is because we were being contacted by so many farmers after they were contacted by developers and they had many, many questions. Um, so we put together an information sheet that spells out some of the issues and considerations that farmers should be thinking about um, when talking with developers or when, or when considering um, lease agreements or options. Um, and that resources is uh, part of your um, list, is included on your list of resources. But we also really strongly encourage landowners to consult with an attorney. And on that sheet, we include some information about how they can find an attorney in Maine, um, including through co the Conservation Law Foundation's Legal Food Hub, which um, provides discounted rates um, for qualifying farmers. Next slide, please. Um, and as with other types of solar projects, MFT is supportive of renewable energy production on land that we have conserved. Um, as long as it's not inconsistent with the purpose of our conservation easements, um, which is primarily focused on ensuring that the land um, is uh, saved for the actual or potential use um, for agricultural purposes. Um, so when a solar energy project request is made on conserved land, we use an internal energy structure siting and approval process guide um, to really balance the benefits of energy production on protected farmland with the purpose of MFT protecting that land um, as part of our decision making process. It's a very fact specific inquiry. But I think one thing we always want to stress is that part of that decision making process really involves MFT stewardship team working with farmers and farmland owners and with the developers to try and come up with a solution. Um, where we can have both that solar energy production while still maintaining the conservation purpose and values. Um, so we, we are very committed to trying to work together um, to make it a win-win for everyone. And people should feel free to reach out to our stewardship team um, if they have um, potential, um, or if they have interest or potential requests. Um, I will just note though that most solar projects on MFT conserved land have involved smaller arrays that are really more focused on meeting the farm's um, own energy needs. Um, most have been for installations on rooftops. And since 2017, MFT's um, conservation easement language generally contemplates um, energy production for on-farm usage as really part of um, the agricultural activities of the farm. And so those types of projects are almost always um, permitted. Um, but in terms of larger solar arrays, um, there's been a lot of interest and inquiries, but there's really been only one formal re request for a larger solar project um, that is currently in development. And we're working with the farmer and with the solar developer um, to try and make that happen. Next slide, please. Yeah, and, that, and that's it. I'm happy to answer um, any questions that you all might have. Thank you very much, Ellen. And I just want to reiterate to everyone on the call today what great resources both Nancy and Ellen, DACF and MFT can, can really be and encourage you if you have questions, if you know farmers that have questions, um, encourage them to reach out. And so we'll take a few minutes now to answer uh, some of the questions that have been in the chat. Um, a few I'm gonna just put off to later on when because they're more appropriate for I think Jake to answer for the economics. But the first one um, is for Nancy. Are there projects that uh, MNAP is not reviewing because it's already determined that there are no uh, resources of concern for them? As I understand it, MNAP reviews anything that comes its way um, relative and regardless of whether or not there's going to be a hit for some of the things that they are looking for. So um, I don't think that MNAP is seeing every project that's been proposed because MNAP is not required to review uh, certain projects. I believe that under the Site Location and Development Act permitting process consultation with MNAP is required. So anything over three acres of impervious service or, 20, or larger than 20 acres um, will go for their review. Um, but 
a lot of the developers reach out to them voluntarily um, as well. So I think they have stepped up and are getting as good a sense of what's out there as any, any other um, state uh, group um, within the state Department of Agriculture or DEP. And, and there, um, Molly Dockery, who, who runs it, is doing an really an essential service um, connecting these dots, as I mentioned earlier. So I'm not going to say that there, it's 100% accurate, but it's, it's a pretty good uh, overview, I believe. Great. Thank you. Um, one more, I guess, probably for you, Nancy. So there's been some. Uh, from what I can understand, some concerns around the accuracy of the NRCS soil data. Um, if you could speak to any issues with that that are coming up when, when soil data is being used. Sure, I think we all know that uh, the soil data is old and it gets updated sporadically at best. So um, I do know that MNAP uses all the tools available to them. Um, they're, they're using the, um, the, that soil data and anything else that may well have been updated um, that they're able to put their hands on. So um, I, I, it would be wonderful if um, those soil data could be update, updated. Um, I, it's just, as I understand it, something that happens on a, a very localized level um, and, and it's not necessarily um, done, a top priority. So um, one thing to mention is that those, the PUC attributes that require a, an affidavit from the soil scientists about whether or not 10% of the acreage impacts prime farmland, um, that does require a site visit. So there are boots on the ground uh, investigations happening. So I think that ideally will allow for the best uh, and latest information to be gathered and utilized. Thank you. One more question for Ellen. Um, who would be the best initial contact or resource um, if someone, if a land trust was looking to get some local land use ordinance changes um, to support a dual use project? Yeah, that is a, um, one of the topics um, that we'll be sort of looking at is um, ways that municipalities, both within Maine and quite honestly in other parts of New England, um, have been able to sort of um, create the right um, mechanisms, um, wh whether it's through um, conditional use permits or overlay districts or what have you, um, to allow for that. Um, so that will be part of the guide that will be coming out. Um, we're still in the research phase um, right now. Um, but I don't know, Emily, if maybe some of the work that you all have been doing across New England might um, provide more information on, in the shorter term. But that will, there will be a whole section on that in our municipal guide um, update because we know that that is um, on the minds of a lot of municipal officials throughout the state. It absolutely is, and, and due to the <laughs> vast number of municipalities, it's hard to track down what, what everyone is doing, and so AFT is also trying to find examples that are, are working well. Um, and, uh, you know, if, if there is an outside main issue, please feel free to reach out to me, and I will do my best to work with our researchers and, and hunt that down for, for those that need it as well. Um, thank you both to Nancy and Ellen for um, the very necessary and important main specific data for, for today's webinar. And um, we're going to move on to Jake Marley, who uh, is the managing director of Hyperion Systems. And he uh, is someone that I've worked with before, sort of understanding what small scale dual use solar can be for farmers. And he's going to take a, a few minutes now to talk to you about the potential economic impacts and, and what that might look like for, for small farms in Maine. Take it away, Jake. Hi, Emily. Thank you for that introduction. Um, I'm Jake Marley, director at Hyperion Systems. Um, we're a small dual use um, focused solar developer and also focused on research based in Amherst, Massachusetts. We've been working on dual use or agrivoltaics um, since about 2009. And um, today we'll be talking about the economics financial research that we've been doing, um, as well as taking a, a high level uh, or a high level overview of a project that we've actually been developing in Western Mass. Uh, 
So Hyperion was started uh, in 2009, really right at the start of the solar boom with the idea of food first, then energy to not take land out of production. Um, this, this was first hypothesized or tested uh, in collaboration with UMass Amherst. This array um, was installed in 2010 and originally it had cattle underneath it for the first five years. And then it got attention from um, NREL, the National Renewable Energy Laboratory to actually expand that research um, and test crops underneath. So that uh, the crops you're seeing there are kale, green bell peppers, Swiss chard, and broccoli. And so since 2016, there have been varying levels of success um, and really depending on the conditions of the year. For example, 2016 was a drought year and across the board, all of the crops um, in the variable group underneath the panels had higher yields than the control group of full sun month. Next slide. Um, I wanted to highlight this slide. So um, Hyperion is um, funded in part by NREL, which is the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. They're a DOE agency focused on energy optimization systems, and they're based in Golden, Golden Colorado. The thing I wanted to highlight here is um, in the upper right hand corner, um, there are about 20 different project sites nationwide. This is really a national effort, uh, getting data points from different geographical regions. Um, Minnesota has been a leader in this, fresh energy. Um, dual use takes on a lot of different names. Uh, it could be pollinator and solar or grazing or actually growing crops. Uh, Minnesota has been really the leader on pollinators. Um, and I would say that University of Arizona has published the most um, comprehensive peer reviewed work to date. Um, um, a research publication that I can post in the chat by uh, Greg Baron Gafford that focused on four different crops at uh, three different locations there in Arizona. But of course, that is um, a much different region than here in the Northeast. Um, so next we'll talk more about the financial work that we've been doing for NREL. Hyperion was tasked with coming up um, in 2015, 2016, um, coming up with a financial model um, that the intent of this model was to compare um, solar uh, or th really three different scenarios a farm with uh, without solar so continuing as is a farm with traditionally installed solar taking land out of production or a third option which would be dual use keeping the land in production having uh, two revenue streams the energy as well as the crop commodity um, this is a really comprehensive model um, it's it's pretty dense and we'll take a, a the next few slides are uh, looks at different snapshots of the model and I'm happy to connect offline. I'll also post this link to the model in the chat after. Um, and happy to work through some of this as well. But um, this is a 250, oh, next slide. Um, this, is, this is the side-by-side -side comparison of the three different scenarios. Um, and you can see in scenario B, tax efficient produces the highest um, IRR or internal rate of return for the farmer or the owner of these projects. This is a graphic representation of the three different scenarios. Again, you can see the blue is the, um, the dual use implementation. And something that I wanna highlight here is actually at the bottom, um, and this is the entry cell or not entry cell. So all of the information um, in the white cells is hard coded and calculations and the green cells are data entry information once you're actually on the model. And go to the next slide. So this model was um, presented or prepared for NREL at the end of 2019. And they were really happy with the work, but again, it's, it's dense and pretty all encompassing. So they wanted to um, create something that is more just eight lines of, of data points. Um, and then if somebody, if the landowner or farmer is more interested and wants to take a deeper dive, they can go then to that financial model. So right here is um, really the, eight most important uh, data points that we, we felt that ultimately this will be incorporated with the NREL SAM model, the system advisory model. Um, this is a 100 kilowatt example with SMART incentives. So SMART is the solar incentive program in Massachusetts that actually has the six cent dual use uh, land base adder that you can see on the left hand side of the screen. So there are different land use categories. A greenfield actually has a subtractor that would be traditionally installed solar taking land out of production. Another example of a incentivized land use would be on landfills. 
um, but that has a different adder category. So that's been something that's uh, been talked about throughout the webinar today, actually creating categories for land use and what those incentives might be. Um, in this uh, eight line overview actually has the, at, at the bottom, uh, assumed loan amount payment. Um, and so this is really just a high level, get the farmer or landowner uh, thinking about this um, potential capital investment and then getting into whether or not they want to take the next step and looking at the model. Ultimately, the non-financial considerations have been uh, of great importance and something that we see might be more impactful for farmers in this decision-making process. So that's the next slide. Um, what we found in the dozens or, or possibly even um, at this point, hundreds of farmers that we've talked with in Massachusetts is that farmers are more likely to invest uh, their their revenues back into the infrastructure to um, produce greater crops rather than into new um, a, a new capital investment like a solar project um, so that that might be there are three different really ownership structures for solar which of course are leases power purchasing agreements or outright owning the system they're more likely to take on one of those first two um, leasing or power purchasing agreement which are similar contracts with nuanced differences um, ultimately, some, all, all um, farmers are different, of course, and so some, um, we like to start the conversation by looking at uh, rooftops and then marginal land, which is something that, again, has been a, a theme throughout this. But we found that with smaller farms, especially with conserved land, um, their land constraint, dual use might be the best option for them, but it becomes tricky. Um, in, given how much behind the meter usage they have, especially on conserved land. So the next slide, um, I sort of got into this already, um, but what is the best use of capital investment? Where do I want to uh, be spending these funds? Those are constant decision-making, non-financial um, non questions, I guess, for the landowner. Um, and the next slide is a project case study, um, a project that we're working on. Currently, the farmer, this is conserved land. Um, so very appropriate for this webinar. Currently, it's, it's under APR, Agricultural Preservation Restriction. And um, currently, it's used to produce squash. This is a 45-acre field. What we're presenting or proposing is a 388 kWDC over two and a half acres. And it will be converted from squash production into a chicken production facility for uh, four different paddocks and nine different, uh, or, or nine weeks overall will be used for chicken production. Um, the things that we want to point out, or I want to point out here, is that this dual use, or ASTGU as it's called in Massachusetts, process differs from traditionally installed solar in that it takes about three or four months of creating a farm plan that MDAR and UMass Clean Energy Extension meets on site, reviews, and then the application goes to DOER for consideration of whether or not it qualifies for the six cent uh, ASTGU adder. I know that this is a lot of information um, at once, so please enter any questions into the chat. Uh, we selected this field over others because of the, as you can see the, on the left-hand side, the existing infrastructure uh, electrical lines. Um, this farmer has limited land at his um, production facility, but he does have a lot of behind the meter usage. So we were allowed to install or able to install a greater capacity system um, in Massachusetts on APR land, the landowner is limited to 200% of behind the meter usage. And so he is um, a value added uh, facility. So he's taking on a lot of different crops from local farmers and um, having a lot of usage behind the meter. Um, so we're able to increase that size, but that's something on the next slide uh, is a key takeaway for solar development on um, land existing with conservation, it's really limited in size on, on two, two sets of factors, the behind the meter usage and then 5% impervious surface limitation. Unfortunately, the overall land area is viewed as impervious, but our argument and something that we're working through right now in this project development with MDAR is viewing only the solar modules themselves as impervious surface, which of course they're not, but uh, trying to change that to increase the uh, 
capacity of the project. And the other key takeaway is the overall project timeline for this. Um, in order to get approved, it has added about three or four months is what we found typical. Um, and also for solo developers, something that's key um, is um, the long-term O&M um, is increased because there's annual reporting and also more just um, working with the farmer to, to uh, oh, I'm being notified that my time is up. Um, but there's m more time involved in this um, long-term and of course in the pre-development process. So the next slide is just thank you and I'll share those links in the chat. Thank you, Jake. We just wanted to make sure we have lots of time to ask you questions because there are several directed uh, right at you. Um, there's one from Clayton Smith before, which uh, is appropriate for now. And that is really in general, could you uh, maybe estimate how much the cost goes up versus normal ground mount to dual use? Yeah, so um, Hyperion's really focused on this medium scale um, solar development, so not residential, but not also this 60 acre uh, multi megawatt capacity. So we're kind of in that several hundred kilowatt scale. And what we found is that typically it, um, the price per watt is increased by about 25 cents up front. So it'll say, say $2 per watt for traditional, and it's $2.25 per watt for this dual use. Great. Thank you. Um, another question for you is, can your model uh, swap out the Massachusetts SMART incentives for uh, main specific um, details? That's a great question. Yes, it can. Um, and you would just enter in different. So you take out the six cent adder, for example, you'd put a zero in for that uh, line item rather than the six cent and happy to work with you offline um, to, to get your feet wet with it, with the model because it is, uh, we've had the criticism. It's not so user friendly, but. <laughs> Um, and another one for you, and this is from, from me. So in, in places where there are not the six cent adder, like in Massachusetts, um, is dual use really feasible? What could make it more feasible? You know, how could that really move forward? Yeah, so there are certainly, um, pollinators and grazing are, are known at this point to, uh, to work. And I think that once you get more into crop production, it's, it's an unknown and Hyperion, other developers are working on expanding that research and, and um, ultimately what are knowns. But um, every year is in, in inherently different for farmers. So it's, it's kind of hard to say exactly with a guarantee or certainty what will work and what won't. Um, again, at this time, grazing, sheep, cattle, uh, we, Hyperion has uh, an array, a small family array that has horses underneath it. Goats are the one uh, animal that would not be recommended for solar or dual use. Um, they tend to jump on things. So. But also also hay production has been um, pretty proven at this point as well. So it's compatible with, with the other types of farming. How is it compatible financially with other states without six cents? <laughs> Uh -huh. I, I apologize if I missed that. Um, it is a little bit, so it, it will push out that um, break even timeline to into the middle teens, upper teens, I would say. Typically, um, large scale solar owners see a break even point in seven or eight years, depending on the state's incentives, of course, um, and, and other factors. Without incentives, you might see that go into the middle teens uh, for okay. the duration. Thank you, Jake. Thanks very much. Thanks to uh, all three of our presenters today uh, for giving us some really good context and the landscape and really how we could move some potential compatible solar forward and that process might look like and how that might benefit farmers. So thank you all today. Um, we're going to move on to one last uh, interactive moment where I would like you to think about what could your next steps be uh, when you're thinking about solar and farmland protection and trying to move these forwards in, in the right direction for our land and climate values. So take a moment, think what maybe that concrete step you would take is and uh, share it in our chat. And then Jamie, if you want to do a couple of housekeeping things while people respond. Yes, definitely. Um, could you go to the next slide for me, Megan? Great, so as you all are thinking about your next steps, hopefully this is one of them. Um, just wanted to remind you that there are two more workshops remaining in the Farms for the Future series that are 
coming up over the next couple of weeks. So for Maine on uh, September 9th, which is next week, strategies and tools for making farmland available to farmers. We're partnering with Land for Good on that one and Steph Morningstar from the Northeast Farmers of Color Land Trust. And we're gonna have a, a lot of um, farmers and service providers on that call. It's, it's gonna be a great opportunity to learn about um, for, for land trusts and municipalities in particular, you know, if you're thinking about making your farmland available to farmers, what do you need to think about? What are some resources and tools? And then on the 24th, which I believe is our very last day of the, the whole series, um, Steph will be leading us in tools and resources for supporting Black, Indigenous, and farmers of color in your community. We're gonna have some really great case studies and speakers on that. So we very much encourage you to attend. Um, and please uh, spread the word. There's definitely room left in, in both of these workshops and um, we hope you and many of your colleagues will join us for that. And uh, Emily, maybe the next one's for you. Yep. So I'll just take a moment while folks still uh, put in their responses to uh, share a little more information about our New England Smart Solar Siting Partnership webinar series that's coming up. Uh, I am also going to put that link in the chat right now. Um, so it's a four-part series where we will be um, first starting on a little bit of a lay of the land policies, programs, and, and progress across New England, and also talking somewhat about the, you know, stakeholder values and, and our sort of, I would say, public view um, of this issue. And then we'll be moving into policies and programs that are working uh, to balance land conservation, and then we'll move into other policies and programs that seem to be growing the solar market, um, things like incentives at the mess, uh, with the mess smart program. And then lastly, we're really gonna try to turn into some very concrete and um, really you know, walk away with some tools that different stakeholders in different states can have in our turning state and local priorities into sound policy. So I encourage you all to take it out, uh, check it out and uh, sign up if you're interested. Um, all right, so let's look at what we have some for our, for our next steps. Uh, keep up with MFT on their municipal solar guidance tools. I am going to do that too. <laughs> uh, explore solar ordinances that support dual use. This is great. Uh, next steps from DACF, issuing solar, sol solar siting guidance. Lots of S's today. Um, working to address the availability to low income households and to work to increase incentives with policymakers. That's great. Um, continue to learn, continue to understand how it relates to conservation easements and uh, continue to be involved with local policies and programs. This is really great. Um, I encourage all of you to take those next steps as we try to make sure that solar siting is going in the the direction that meets land needs and climate needs simultaneously. Take it away, Jamie. Great. So I'm feeling like we're gonna end on time. This is very exciting. Um, we just wanna give a very special thanks to today's powerhouse presenters, Emily, uh, Ellen, Nancy, and Jake for sharing your wisdom with us. Um, we're just so inspired by all the work they're doing and we really, really appreciate you taking the time to come on and share that with them. With us today and um, you know just to the folks on the call please do reach out to these speakers they're very happy to, to follow up with you and answer any questions that you have. Um, we also just want to um, ask for a favor from you all um, we'd really love your feedback on uh, how this workshop went for you today anything you liked anything you'd hope that we uh, would have done or could improve um, it's also an opportunity um, we want to know kind of what your next steps are again and, and as a way for us to follow up with you uh, with any resources that we may have access to. So um, Megan awesomely just pasted that link uh, in the chat. So if you'd be willing to literally just pop that open in your browser. Um, so you might do it right after you get off this call. Otherwise, we will be emailing out um, the resource handout and this very link um, probably after this call today or sometime tomorrow. So you'll have access to it then. But thank you in advance for your feedback. We really, really appreciate it. And then I guess, um, you know, we just want to want to wrap up um, by saying, you know, uh, thank you so much for, for being here with us today. Um, you're, you're closing out this uh, this week's series of, of the solar webinar and we're feeling just really good about these great conversations that we've had over the last few days and um, loved, loved ending it here with with you folks from Maine. Um, so just feel free to follow up with with me or with Emily with any of the speakers with any questions that you have. 
And we really do hope to see you next week at the Making Farmland Available for Farmers <coughs> workshop. So we're actually going to end a few minutes early, which is fairly remarkable. Um, so enjoy those few minutes extra as part of your day. Thank you all so much. And um, we, we just hope you have a great day. Hope to see you soon. Thanks, everybody. Use those minutes to fill out the survey. <laughs> fill out the survey. That's why we ended early. Please do. <laughs> Thanks so much, everyone. Thank you, Thank guys. You. Thanks Be so well. much. Yeah, thanks team.